Hey babies and gentlemen, and welcome to another fantastically amazing episode of the DAC Report on Philosophy. And we will continue today to tackle the problem of evolutionary ethics, okay? So, the problem of evil in evolutionary ethics. Ethics, I mean, atheists generally are familiar with the argument from evil concerning the existence of God. Evolutionary ethics has its own problem of evil. A problem that shows that the thesis that humans evolved some sort of moral sense is barking up the wrong moral tree. Clearly, humans have the capacity to do evil. If one gets caught up in the evolutionary view of ethics, one could almost come to the conclusion that humans are incapable of doing evil. After all, evolution has given us a moral sense to guide our actions, to make us kind and altruistic. The main assertion made when an atheist presents an evolutionary account of ethics seems to be that we do not need to worry about humans doing evil even if there were no God. Our evolutionary evolved moral dispositions would prevent us from doing evil even if there were no God. Only, it hasn't worked at all that well so far. Whatso whatever one wants to say about an evolved moral sense and capacity to perform kindness, we also have within our nature the capacity to do great evil. And this escapes most objectivists, I, may add, I might add. In fact, every act of tyranny and injustice committed in human history, genocide, torture, tyranny, racial injustice, slavery, all of it is within our evolved nature. We know this merely because of the fact that it has happened. This leads us to a question that is, by definition, outside of the realm that any evolutionary ethicist can answer. What do we do about the, eth the evils that are clearly within our evolved nature? People are not concerned with those evils that we have no capacity to perform. The idea of a person fearing the possibility of somebody doing evil that is impossible for him to do would actually be a paradigm example of irrationality. The evils that people are concerned with when they think about the issue of morality are evils that surround us. The abduction and rape of our children, the slaughter of our neighbors while shopping in a mall or going to work, the lynching of man because of his race, the enslavement of thousands of people, and the imprisonment and slaughter of those who would dare speak in opposition to the current realm. The evolutionary ethicist responds, don't worry, it is in our genes to not do these things, is simply false. This may appear to be a straw man, that no evolutionary ethicist would ever say such a thing. However, my argument is not that this is a claim of the evolutionary ethicist. My argument is that the evolutionary ethicist is caught in the horns of a dilemma. Either he must make such an absurd and false claim, or he must admit that evolutionary ethics has absolutely nothing to say about the questions that people are really concerned about when they address the issue of morality, the evils that surround us every day and that are clearly within our nature to perform. How do we minimize these evils? So, I have been criticizing the evolutionary ethicists who claim that we have evolved a disposition to view certain things as moral or immoral by confronting them with a pair of questions. Is something good because it is loved by our genes, or is it loved by our genes because it is good? This is simply the classic argument against divine command theories of morality applied to evolutionary morality. And two, what are we to do about all the evil that is still within our evolved capacity to perform? Obviously, we have not evolved such a moral sense that we do not engage in moral crimes of all sizes. A member of the studio audience suggests that evolutionary ethics can avoid these objections because it is purely descriptive, not prescriptive. And quoting, if no one is saying that evolutionary psychology is in any way prescriptive of moral actions, but rather descriptive of the development for moral capacity, how are they on the horns of a dilemma? Okay, if evolutionary ethics is entirely descriptive rather than prescriptive, 
then it says absolutely nothing about what we ought to do. And if it says nothing about what we ought to do, then how can it possibly be used to answer the question of the possibility of morality, a set of things that we should or should not do without God? Evolutionary ethics would, in the sense, be as divorced from morality as chemistry, capable of telling us how to make a bomb, but, able, but unable to say anything about whether we should or should not use that bomb. So, it is not an argument for what actions we should take, then it has nothing to do with morality. Because morality is concerned with arguments about what actions we should take. If this is what is involved, then the theist can take everything that the evolutionary atheist says and still answer, okay, evolution have gave us a sense of right and wrong, however, it cannot tell us anything about what is right or wrong in fact. Only God can do that. If the evolutionary atheist is not talking about things being right or wrong in fact, then they have not answered the objection that God is necessary for the understanding of things being right or wrong as a matter of fact. Now, I do not dispute that our desires have been under the influence of evolutionary forces, nor do I dispute that there is reason to believe that have some disposition toward desires that count as kin altruism, reciprocity and the like, yet I count these as simple desires. However, these are just desires like our taste for certain types of food and our desire for sex. There is no more of a moral sense in a mother's desire to feed her child than there is in a mother's desire to have sex to start with, or to eat the ice cream she ate when she was pregnant. Furthermore, we do not need a moral sense to get us to perform these actions. Following the principle that the simplest explanation is usually the right one, also known as Occam's razor, all nature needs to give us is a set of desires to engage in this type of behavior. Putting those desires in the form of a moral sense is a lot of extra work for nothing. What is a moral sense anyway? How is it different from a simple desire? And what types of evidence do we have that we are dealing with a moral sense instead of a set of simple desires? The descriptive evolutionary ethicist needs to explain these to us before he can justify his claim that he has found a way to account for a moral sense. He needs to define what it is that he is accounting for. The habit of claiming that our desires represent some sort of moral sense is a piece of ancient rhetoric used to give one's preferences more weight than they deserve. It provides a way of making an entirely unjustifiable leap of logic from I like and I do not like to you should and you should not. The way we make this leap is by taking the object of our desires and claiming that what is really going on is that we are perceiving a property that is built into the object of evaluation. This property takes the form of an intrinsic ought of beingness, or ought of being not, or ought not to beingness, I mean. From here we can jump straight to the conclusion that those who do not see the value that we do. In this case, it works just like the God argument works. With the God argument, a priest takes his or her own preferences and assigns them to God. He then asserts, it is not the case that I'm inferring from what I like and what I do not like to what you should and should not do. Actually, I am making an inference from what God likes and does not like to what you should or should not do. Ignoring the fact, of course, that the priest assigned his or her preferences to God. So accounting for a moral sense is like accounting for ghosts. The best account we have is that there is no such thing. Thus, there is nothing for the evolutionary ethicist to account for. Thus, the original problem still remains. When the theist challenges the ethicist to come up with an account of moral value in the absence of God, the atheist's job must be to come up with an account of things that we ought and ought not to do in the absence of a God. If evolutionary ethics is not telling us what we should and should not do in the absence of a God explanation that is, is not answering the question, then it is not the type of thing the atheist should bring forth in this type of debate. So I hope you enjoyed this video. I'll be back later with some more tasty Shia. See you all. This was Salazar.